Hello everyone, we are going to allow a few minutes for attendees to arrive. Hi, we're going to allow another minute for people to arrive. I would like to welcome you all to the fourth part of the series, Summer Tea with Curators, The Five Senses Touch. I am Lauren Shea Warner, Membership Engagement and Stewardship Coordinator. This five part series is an informal exploration of the five senses through the lens of museum's collection. Today's speakers are Henriette Ketsta Brees, Cunningham Center Manager and Assistant Curator of Prints, Drawings and Photographs, and Yao Wu, Jane Chase Carroll, Curator of Asian Art. If you go to the next slide, I can show you, um, there will be a Q&A following the presentation. The questions, you, there's a question button on the top left of your screen. And I will now turn it over to Henriette. Hello and welcome. Um, so today, um, my colleague Yao Wu and I are going to be talking about two works from our collection. Um, so Yao yeah, will be talking about a photograph uh, by Felice Bayato, a British Italian photographer uh, titled um, Our Painter. And I will be talking about um, a German engraving, a print uh, titled The Two Buffoons by Hans Sebald Beham. Um, and um, so we can go over to the next slide. Okay. So I wanted to start off uh, with this image. Um, since we're all sitting in front of our computer screens, um, the sense of touch, which is the subject of today, um, is uh, the one sense that I think in this time of the pandemic, we have been deprived of the most. And it's been images like this that have been coming by on the, the internet and um, that really kind of illustrate uh, this desire to be close to people and to be able to have physical connection uh, to, uh, to each other. Um, this, uh, we all have this you know, like positive kind of, um, associations with, um, with the sense of touch. However, uh, touch historically, and especially in like from early medieval Europe um, um, to like 15th and 16th century, there had been a discussion um, of the senses as being kind of uh, a gateway to, uh, to uh, vice. And touch had historically been the most dangerous of all the senses. It was the one that could most easily lead to corruption and luxuria, which is um, self indulgent sexual pleasure or lust, and that, that can lead to idleness, uh, corruption, and then ultimately could lead to man's downfall. 
So women in this context were seen as especially vulnerable to this. Um, they were seen as impressionable, weak, um, but cunning creatures uh, because they were easily seduced by sin. And Eve is obviously the, mo the best example of this, where she seduced Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that would mark the beginning of all human corruption. So with the onset of Reformation in Northern Europe, uh, one started to question this kind of all encompassing the religious doctrines that were going around of the medieval period, and they were stepping into the light of humanism. So people had to start uh, thinking of themselves and have to find their own moral compass uh, without the constant guiding uh, hand of the of the church. So then I will go to the next slide. So it's then when we can um, we come to humanist printmakers like um, Hans Sebald Beham. Um, he was uh, from Nuremberg, Germany, very interesting printmaker. He was a part of a group of printmakers called the Kleinmeisters or the Small Masters because they worked on a really small scale. This is a tiny print and we're seeing it much larger than it actually is. Um, they were incredibly um, um, crafty and, and had incredible artistic skill. And, um, and they really loved to kind of illustrate, kind of gave us, give us an insight into this moral plight, the moral, the moral dilemmas that were going around at the time. And, um, and so they were trying to help us find our moral equilibrium. However, these prints are extremely tricky because they seduce as much as they educate. As you can see here, um, it's also what makes them so incredibly fun to look at. There's so much to look at. They always find these saucy subjects um, uh, and they themselves, the Kleinmeisters, were con uh, quite controversial. They, um, they actually were seen um, during a trial in Nuremberg. Um, they were um, he held to account because they were regarded as godless paintings. Um, they, um, they were, um, um, uh, they were anti, like, they didn't believe in baptism, they didn't believe in Christ, and they also didn't believe in transubstantiation. And that actually got them removed out of Nuremberg. They were banned for at least a year, as the accounts go. So they were, you know, they were controversial. So um, this print here um, is wonderful in its iconography and it obviously is um, a, a couple of um, a, an amorous, potentially amorous couple. There is something going on in, in the way that they're sitting in front of each other. Um, their, their legs are intertwined, um, they're in mid-conversation possibly, um, and they're both fools. Um, so there are lots of, there's lots of sexual innuendo and there's lots of uh, iconography that, you know, that is very suggestive. Um, and we can go to the next slide. I'll just highlight a couple of these um, obvious images. So the fools are ho both holding um, some attributes. Some, and uh, the, the male fool is holding this curious object. It's actually an attribute that goes with the fool's costume. Um, and um, the fool is holding here what is called a, um, a Narrenwurst or, um, or a fool's sausage. It's actually a weapon. It was a leather pouch that was filled with horse hair and it could really pack a wallop. So, um, and the woman is holding a vessel, um, she's, um, and which also was a symbol for the womb or the vagina. So obviously there's a lot of pretty obvious sexual um, uh, innuendo going on. So we can go to the next slide. And um, so on the, they're obviously having these, um, these uh, donkey ears, um, which is another um, attribute of the fool, but there's also these feathers on top and they're actually cox feathers, which are also, um, I mean, um, roosters were, have lots of meaning in iconography, but in this case, I think we can say that it's, um, it's also lasciviousness and uh, is, 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 is involved here. And then the, um, the, the little um, flask that the, ma the, the male fool is holding is another curious object. It's, um, it's a wine flask and it's called in German a boxbeutel, which um, is also translatable as a ram's scrotum. So that there's also connotations with the devil and, um, and, um, and also lasciviousness and sin. So we can go to the next slide. 
So the other interesting thing here is that um, there are two fools and it's male and female fools and female fools uh, were curiously enough not very often depicted like this. Female fools were not a thing um, un unless you would go and um, find out about uh, the ship of fools. The ship of fools was a book um, was actually the first bestseller um, that was published. I mean, this is all in the onset of printmaking. Um, and by Sebastian Brandt, um, who was, um, who created this book, um, The Ship of Fools, which was a depiction of fools in all the most, um, um, like all the ways that man could get into trouble. And I can go to the next slide. And here, here is um, actually a depiction of the addendum, and I will go into that. So the ship of fools was um, uh, represented uh, all these male fools and all the things that would uh, they could um, how they all the ways that they would get into trouble. Um, however, when this book was translated and it was translated in lots of different languages, when it was translated into French, the French thought it might be um, a good idea to. Um, to also um, create an addendum uh, because they felt it had it was you know it was definitely lacking because it didn't show any female fools so they had um, they um, they had a, um, a Flemish printmaker who was living in Paris at the time and they um, asked him to create a female version and this is the ship uh, this is the ship of female fools and interestingly enough um, the way it were they were the way they were depicted was by these different ships that would represent the different senses because the senses as i said before were kind of the gateway to vice so here is the sense of touch and um, with a woman at the helm and uh, this is the kind of the way that they would um, um, illustrate the the ways that touch could um, get you into trouble so there was also um, and we can go to the next slide there was also a positive um, version of the sense of touch. And um, uh, George Pence was an other Kleinmeister. Um, this is also a very small uh, print. He did a whole series of the senses, and this is his depiction of the sense of touch. And here we see um, a woman, uh, she's nude, on the, however, but she is sitting and doing something very productive with her hands, and her hands are often um, the symbol of, uh, of touch, and she is weaving something. So here um, we actually get a sense of how um, the virtuous side of the, the, the equation can be um, put to use. So um, I wanted to end it on this, um, on this uh, in this way. Um, so, um, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Yao. Thank you, Henriette. Um, so just now, Henriette was uh, primarily discussing um, the sense of touch as a subject matter, but she ended on um, with um, a photograph, uh, sorry, with an engraving, a print um, that shows, you know, um, an, a woman in the process of making. So my part of the presentation today will be focused more on uh, the role that touch plays in the production of art, but also uh, the role that touch plays in the consumption and circulation of art. But of course, you know, even with the previous uh, works of art, Henriette showed, you know, be it uh, woodcut or engraving, we we'll know that you know um, in that very laborious process of cutting the the wood block or cutting the, the the plate, you know there is touching involved already, and that's what I will be talking about today. Um, so this image we see on the screen is a hand colored albumin print. So it's a photograph by um, an artist by the name of Felix Biado, uh, who was uh, Italian born, um, a British uh, photojournalist. So prior to this, the making of this photograph, he had already spent time in the Middle East, uh, India and China, uh, reporting on military expeditions and campaigns. And then uh, in 1863, he arrived uh, in the Japanese uh, treaty port uh, Yokohama, and he would reside there for the next two decades or so. Um, and there he became uh, one of the uh, most prolific uh, photographers and also operated one of the most successful commercial uh, photo studios there. 
uh, even though we know today that he might not have been the very first, but he was definitely um, you know, known for having popularized hand coloring on album and prints in Japan. Um, and in this very photograph we see here, the subject matter is actually our painter. So it's the painter who executed hand coloring on the photographs uh, in his photo studio. And uh, in this very photograph, we actually also see a few areas where, you know, um, you see traces of hand coloring. So the first one uh, that I will point out is the brush that he's holding in his right hand. And um, you will see that it's not entirely black and white. Um, there is a yellowish tint to it. So very possibly this brush itself uh, was hand colored at some point. And I really like the pose, you know, uh, which is captured here. He's holding a brush on, uh, in his left, right hand, and he's holding possibly a photograph that he's about to color in his left hand. It's this moment of suspense that's captured, you know, by the photographic um, lens that's quite interesting here. So um, this, this very um, moment of touching the photograph with the, the, um, the brush uh, is very telling here. And also another area um, that has been uh, hand colored is um, the glasses he wears uh, over his face. Um, I know that this is a reproduction on the screen, so you might not see it very well, but you will just have to <laughs> take my word for it. Um, when I was able to examine this uh, in person, you know, physically touching the, uh, the, the photograph, um, you could tell that it was actually uh, hand colored in. And um, you will see that the, the leg of the, um, the glasses is not really touching his ear properly. So that's maybe, you know, a hint for you uh, who is looking at it um, on the screen that it's not really something that he wears. Other, rather, it's something that an artist, you know, hand colored in later on. And a third area um, that's in this photograph that's been hand colored is the album um, that's popped up um, behind the painter. So on the cover, you will see some patches of uh, yellow or gold or orangey kind of color. So um, those patches have been hand colored in as well to potentially imitate, you know, silk brocade kind of color or um, co covers of albums that have been, uh, you know, uh, coated with lacquer. So um, I know that this photograph uh, doesn't have extensive areas of uh, hand coloring. So if we could go to the next slide, I will give you another example of, you know, more um, hand coloring, um, you know, being applied to the photographs. So apparently, you know, both uh, images were printed from the same negative, even though, you know, with the uh, vignettes, uh, one is shown horizontal and one is showing, uh, sh shown like vertically now. Um, and um, we will see that there are actually two types of coloring involved in these two photographs. So one kind of coloring is, uh, is more extensive for larger areas of toner shades. So uh, those are primarily colors of black or reddish brown or purple. So seeing those photographs, potentially, you know, the um, uh, trunk on which she sits or the cushion, you know, that's behind her, you know, this kind of uh, brownish or purple colors were um, large areas that were introduced during the develop development process by adding uh, chemicals that would then interact with the albumin print uh, itself, uh, sorry, albumin uh, paper itself. So for more, more focused areas as seen, you know, in the um, uh, umbrella here or the porcelain uh, vessel uh, in the foreground or the uh, teapot at the background or even some ornaments she wears on her hair or on her clothes, you know, kind of uh, blue color or red color, these colors uh, are more vivid um, in life and these were added on to the completed prints. So um, these are two types of coloring that's happening. And for photographs like this, we've already, we're already seeing two versions of them, of, of it. Um, templates were often uh, involved. So uh, the artists would cut um, templates to ensure consistency uh, across multiple uh, prints printed from the same negative. And of course, I think you will notice that these two colors now, you know, uh, these two prints now show different levels of discoloration or fading. Um, and that's because, you know, both the albumin uh, paper itself and the organic uh, pigments uh, are uh, susceptible to fading and discoloration. So uh, because of their different levels of uh, exposure to light and, um, and other um, pollutants, now these two prints uh, show um, colors very differently already. So we pointed out the album that was sitting on the floor in the uh, portrait of our painter. And if we go to the next slide, please. Um, 
on the top left, I'm showing you the uh, cover of the album from which the uh, Smith College Museum of Arts photographs uh, are taken. So when uh, this group of 50 photographs came into our collection, they came bound together in one album. Um, and we later on, you know, um, basically uh, took them out one by one and matted them um, and framed them one by one for exhibition and for preservation purposes. But on the right, I'm showing you um, an example from the Getty Museum of how the album uh, would have been looked at. So here is a full spread. So you would have a photograph on the right and then a caption that would accompany the photo photograph on the left. So as you flip through this album, you would read and look at the, uh, the photograph at the same time. So on the screen too, I show you a um, just a sign that you see just often, too often in museum settings, you know, where we as museum professionals tell our visitors to do not touch. And, you know, this label um, very, um, you know, accurately explains uh, the reason, you know, it's really for the pres preservation of the artworks. But it does, you know, point out a dilemma that contemporary museums face today, you know, for the production of artwork or even for the original consumption of artworks, they're oftentimes meant to be touched, you know, um, whereas when we just, you know, treat the photographs individually and put them up on the wall as a single image behind, behind plastic glass, you lose that sense of touch with the photograph. Um, but I will say that museums definitely uh, try to, you know, sort of make up for that loss um, as much as possible. And uh, nowadays with modern technology, we often see like touch screen, touch screen, uh, where you can flip through uh, pages uh, that have been uh, repurposed or reproduced on, on the screen. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is the caption that uh, accompanies uh, our painter, the photograph that I, uh, I discussed today. Um, and just uh, for those who can't read uh, you know, on this screen well, very well, uh, I will just uh, read out the second paragraph uh, just to give you a sense of this caption. Um, so it goes like this. Some of the Yedo artists, so, so Yedo is uh, Edo, which is contemporary Tokyo. Some of the Tokyo artists live entirely by being invited out to parties where they draw pictures to order, turning out in a few strokes of the brush a Mount Fuji, a warrior in full armor, a dragon and tiger, or a bamboo grove. Sometimes even some little scene of more intimate Japanese life unpresentable to eyes polite. His stipend is small, but so are his requirements. If he has rice enough for the day, he takes no care for the morrow. The amusement of the moment is the business of his life. So this is a very vivid description of who the painter was, right? But not without its problems, apparently. Um, so the question first uh, is, who wrote these captions, right? So as far as we know, uh, it was uh, really uh, all these captions were um, primarily authored by the um, foreign community uh, residing in Yokohama. So other journalists, you know, like Beato, uh, people, you know, from uh, the UK in particular, you know, who he was associated with, they would write, uh, author these this, this captions. And why would they write the captions in such a way? So the leading, the question leads to, you know, who was reading these captions? Who were looking at um, these albums? So those albums were, you know, largely sold to foreign, um, foreigners uh, passing through Japan or people who resided in Japan for a period of time and then would return to, to their home country. They would wanna, you know, buy an album as sort of a souvenir. So, with that in mind, we know that, you know, Beato, you know, being a very successful businessman um, in the first place, knew his uh, clientele really, really well. So he knew how to cater to the taste uh, of, you know, uh, his foreign clientele. But we also know that this kind of quasi ethnographic approach attitude or this kind of uh, authoritative uh, tone really also helped um, or contributed to the reinforcement of uh, stereotypes of the Japanese, right, in the eyes of Westerners. Um, and apparently, you know, uh, judged from this caption and the image itself, we knew that artists, Japanese artists, uh, was quite uh, uh, interesting to foreigners. It was of great interest. People wanted to know more about them. And um, this, even though the artist is not named, we do know that it's true that there was a large number of Japanese artists who were employed by photo studios. They had actually primarily, you know, previously been trained to work in woodblock uh, print sh shops. But by then, you know, photography sort of took it over, became more popular than um, woodcut prints. So these artists became unemployed in uh, woodblock shops. 
but in turn, you know, they would make take advantage of their uh, technical skills to uh, hand color photographs instead. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So here I show you, you know, several different images of this very same unnamed painter, um, you know, who uh, set for uh, the photographs that Beato would take. So he appears, you know, a number of times in summer clothes or in uh, winter clothes. Um, you know, we know that some of these portraits uh, in Beato's albums, they were staged. So the sitter might not be from the very uh, occupation or profession that's described in the caption. But in this instance, because he does appear several times and diff in different times of types of clothing, um, it's possible that it was in fact um, an, an, an artist employed by the studio, but we don't know his name, which is very telling in itself. And as we see from the titles of these uh, captions, you know, my artist, our painter, our chief artist, all these possessive pronouns used, you know, um, it's very indi indicative of the hierarchy that's set up in the studio between Beato and his employees, right, his Japanese employees. Um, and uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is um, the caption, different from the one um, that we showed just now, um, but also about the artist. Um, and uh, it takes a different approach to introducing the artist. Um, and here I will just read to you the very first paragraph. It says, in the sciences of drawing and painting, the Japanese have uh, hitherto scarcely advanced to mediocrity. And yet in the art of coloring small pictures, which may be looked upon as a mechanical art, they have attained under foreign instruction, singular excellence. It is a work that well accords with a character of patience in details, often shown in the necessity which, with which some of the patterns and figures on their lacquered cabinets and other articles are finished. And I will stop here, but it gives you a very good sense of you know the problematic caption you know um, this kind of condescending attitude if not outright racist attitude you know that's conveyed through these captions but you know we should also bear in mind that you know um, this was the 19th century and you know this was the moment when cultures from different parts of the world different parts of the globe came into touch came into um, contact for sort of the first time in human history so there was this, you know, uh, stereotypical understanding of another culture or, you know, problematic way of understanding a, a, another culture, very judgmental. Um, so just think about how far we've gone, we've, we've come to, you know, from the 19th century to the 21st century, where Japanese art is largely appreciated, you know, in the West, you know, by uh, contemporary uh, Western museums, such as, you know, the Smith College Muse Museum of Art, you know, we um, are reminded how, you know, sort of um, cross-cultural touch is, is so crucial. And particularly in this moment of pandemic, you know, I want to remind us that, you know, really this kind of touch between people, touch between cultures would, you know, deepen um, empathy and understanding um, and to achieve common goals, you know, uh, for, for humankind. So with that, I will turn um, to my colleague, Taiga, who will uh, manage the Q&A sections. Thank you, Yao. I will share questions now with Henriette and Yao for maybe about five or 10 minutes uh, to not go too far over our 30 minute program. So Yao, related to the photographs, we have a question was hand coloring of photographs in Japan also done by women or primarily by men? Um, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, primarily by men. I mean, that's just, you know, how um, the profession of uh, sort of artisans or artists was like back then. But I mean, I know that it's uh, an area of research for a lot of art historians to see, you know, sort of female artistic talent in late adult or early Meiji period. But I think percentage wise, definitely more, more men. Yeah. Thank you. Now, uh, Henriette. I'm going to refer you back to the pens. We have a question. Can you say anything about the spider web in the pens? And interesting that they are both weaving. Yes. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate we don't have the image right in front of us. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, there. I knew there were going to be questions about the iconography because there's so much to see. Um, and I couldn't cover it all. I wish I could have. Um, however, the the image, uh, insects are interesting in, in both uh, prints, but the spider in the pens, which um, if you remember, it's all the way in the top, 
it's um, it alludes to the the sense of weaving. It's another industrious animal. The spider has other meanings in iconography, but in this case, it it clearly is associated with the industriousness of the weaver. The who the spider is obviously is weaving his web. So I think in this case, that's what it refers to. All right. And to follow on that, we have a question about the dragonflies. Ah, yes. <laughs> Do they symbolize anything in particular? Oh, yes, yes. I, I did do some research uh, regarding uh, the flying, uh, the dragonflies. Uh, um, the dragonfly is very interesting. I always thought it was a very interesting name, the dragonfly in itself. Um, and I always wondered what that name came from, but it actually has a very interesting background um, in, in uh, Northern European folklore. Um, it is related to the, um, the, um, the story of St. George attacking the devil with his angels, with angels backing him up, and the devil um, possesses his horse, and, uh, and then uh, George abandons his horse, and his, uh, his horse then turns into a dragonfly. Um, and it's like this weird um, relationship to, to the devil. And, and so I think in this case, the devil is, a, is again, um, you know, this, the, the, the image of sin, of, of seduction. And, um, and that's one explanation. There have been other explanations that this particular image is um, a depiction of um, the folly of love and that these insects, these buzzing insects are symbols of this particular kind of folly. But um, insects have been used in different ways. So it's always hard to figure out exactly what they mean. Hey, thank you. Now, turning back to Yao, um, so uh, this viewer writes, I am surprised by the, condescen the condescension. Weren't Japanese respected by European artists like Van Gogh, used them extensively in his works? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that first of all, there is, um, you know, a, a time lapse kind of, you know, uh, here a little bit. I mean, this uh, photograph, the photo albums were published uh, in the 1860s, whereas, you know, the artist, the impressionist artists, you know, they were just, uh, you know, picking up sort of uh, Japanese, you know, back in Europe at the time, you know, they were looking at, um, you know, prints uh, primarily as sources of inspiration. So this was just kind of the beginning of that. Um, and of course, you know, there is also a difference between, you know, the kind of the, the general public and maybe the artistic communities, you know, for the artists like Van Gogh, you know, they look at something, you know, compositionally uh, refreshing or, you know, uh, speaking of the palette also like, you know, interesting, they took inspiration from that. But, you know, for the general public, it's not actually not super surprising that, you know, they looked at another culture um, uh, in such a uh, problematic way by, 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 t by today's standard. And I, I didn't uh, really talk about the organization of the albums themselves. I mean, it was actually um, in 1868, um, Beato published uh, two volumes, um, you know, they are uh, both uh, loosely titled, you know, Views of Japan. And the first um, a volume was for uh, landscapes, so places um, in particular, and then the second volume was um, of uh, portraits of people and then of genre scenes. Um, so with both volumes, you know, the intention was quite clear to give people a glimpse of what, you know, Japanese places look like, what Japanese people look like. But, you know, um, with that, you know, goal, um, definitely there is a lot of, uh, you know, stereotypes uh, being reinforced uh, through, um, you know, either the images themselves or the captions. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to the BAM, um, Henriette, where are the two buffoons sitting? What is the setting? Um, and maybe you said this a little earlier, the viewer saying they came in a little bit late. <laughs> oh, no, I did not talk about that because like I said before, um, uh, there's a lot, a lot to talk about in this uh, print. Um, well, um, they're sitting in, in some kind of an enclosure and um, there are at the time a lot of references to um, gardens of love and those were usually enclosed, beautifully sculpted gardens. And I think, um, I think, Sebald Beom is, is kind of poking fun of that in that they're sitting in kind of a, um, in a very kind of uh, 
pull together garden of love. So it's that kind of the, the pedestrian kind of garden of love in, in some regards because they're fools, no, no less. So I think, I think he's kind of playing with that, that concept of the formal garden of love. Okay, with that, I think we'll bring our program to a close. Thank you all, and I'll turn it back to Lauren. I wanted to thank you all also for attending the program and thank Yao and Henriette for their wonderful presentation, Taiga for the Q&A, and Emma Chubb for running in the background all of the presentation. If we didn't get to your question, I would like you to please contact the SNA members email located on your screen. We hope you can get join us for our final part of the series. We're coming to an end, oh my gosh, hearing on Thursday, September 3rd. The link for this program will be sent to you tomorrow in your email, or you can also find it on our website. We hope you to see you next time.